It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Harker. He's the CEO for the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia for about three and a half plus years. And prior to that, he was the president of the University of Delaware. And prior to that, he was the dean of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He was named the White House Fellow by President George H.W. Bush in 1991. He served as a special assistant to the FBI director, Director William Sessions, at that time. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Harker. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for being here. It's really a pleasure for us to host you here at the Philly Fed. And so, and particularly, you, know, we, you never know what's going to happen with the weather. So we get lucked out today. Uh, I was down in Washington yesterday, and it was miserable. It's miserable in a lot of ways, but it was miserable uh, <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the weather is pretty, pretty wet. So again, I had a very easy commute today. I just walked across the building. And I know you, some of you came from uh, further than that, for sure. So again, I want to thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Philly Fed and everyone here for being here. So I want to start, we're going to have Q&A, but I want to start with an economic outlook, talk about where we are, where we're likely headed, and what I'm watching as we make our way there, wherever we're going. And then discuss something that's a real focus of ours here at the Philly Fed, and that's the future of work, the labor markets, the skills, the future that we are creating right now in terms of the workplace and the skills necessary to succeed in that workplace. But before I start any of these remarks, I have to give the standard Fed disclaimer. This is very important, so I don't get in trouble. Uh, the views I express today are mine alone, and they don't reflect anyone else in the Federal Reserve System <laughs> or on the Federal Open Market Committee. There. Now, you're all my witnesses. I said that. So let's start with GDP. So GDP, I see GDP growth uh, slightly above 2% for the year and trending down to 2% sometime in 2020. Well, some of you may think that growth is disappointing. It does reflect some structural slow-moving forces like demographics, muted growth in the labor force, and stubbornly low productivity growth that we've seen now for quite a while, not just in the U.S., but globally. So it's those factors, rather than any temporary headwinds, that bring our forecast down to around 2%. But this is still positive. I still see this outlook as positive. The U.S. economy continues to grow in what is on pace to be the longest economic expansion in our country's history. I should also deliver the caveat that those are my projections for the year as a whole. In this quarter, Q1, uh, we expect that number, GDP, to come in close to 1.5 percent, and there are lots of reasons for that. There are lots of potential reasons for that. One is the government shutdown has shaved off a bit of GDP growth, but there's another more fundamental issue that's worth noting, that um, first quarters have been low or negative growth for several years running, enough to have essentially become the norm. And most economists think there's probably some measurement issue or something going on in Q1 that's been pretty persistent over the course of now many years. So that 1.5% uh, will balance out over the course of the year. We'll see growth pick up and average, again, slightly north of 2%. Now, in terms of uh, what's driving that, personal consumption, personal consumption expenditure is the real driver of our economic growth. And you look at households, households continue to spend at a good clip. Businesses, though, on the other hand, have reported a real increase in uncertainty, and they're starting to report some decrease in confidence. Coupled with tighter financial conditions, I take that as the investment outlook uh, is not quite as rosy this year as it was last year. Last year, there was a lot of exuberance. We're not feeling that so much right now. It's certainly not a dire situation, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not a dire situation, but that specter of uncertainty does cast a shadow. And the amb ambiguity, and lots of ambiguity about the current climate, appears to have a dampening effect on business investment. Now, we're also monitoring international influences, including the outlook for growth abroad, and of course, trade developments, which will have an impact on our economy. So on the balance, when I look at where we are, I would say that the risks right now are slightly tilted to the downside. Not big time tilted to the downside. I mean, you need to see a protractor versus uh, to see that tilt down as opposed to seeing it just glaring at you. But I do think there's some 
uh, negative tilt to the, uh, the risk that we're facing. But really, you look, overall, this is still a very good economy. The economy is still in very good shape. Now, so one clear example of that, of the strength of the economy, is the labor market. Employment data continues to show remarkable health. And in fact, has surprised me and many other experts uh, by the continued strength of the labor market. Job creation continues at a very strong pace. Quits are still high. By the way, quits are a good thing in our world. That means people feel confident enough to quit a job to go get another job, right? So quits are a good thing. And the slight upticks in unemploy the unemployment rate in the past couple of months, actually, that's also a good thing because it reflects more people coming off the sidelines back into the labor force. That's a healthy sign for the economy. So the primary thing we're hearing, anecdotally and in our survey work, that we're hearing the biggest problem in the labor market is just not enough labor, not enough people with the right skills to fill the jobs that are out there. And then, la so that's part one of our dual mandate from Congress at the Fed, is maximum employment. We, that numbers, those numbers continue to be very good. So what's the second part of that? Price stability or inflation. Inflation is running around our preferred 2% target, and for several years, it was persistently low. We could not get it up to 2%, and it finally moved up to that goal last year. So I see inflation running slightly higher, the 2% for this year and next. And so as Fed watchers well know, I think, when we say our goal is 2% inflation, we don't mean we're going to hit 2%, that sweet spot, exactly right on all the time. It's our average, our medium-term average. We're going to bounce above and below that a little bit. And so I would be concerned if we saw a significant rise in inflation all of a sudden uh, and running slightly above and accelerating past the 2% uh, number. But I don't see that happening this year, or in, even in our planning horizon, in our forecast. Um, we've seen a persistent underperformance, as I said. We've moved up to 2%, but even today, uh, CPI came out, the Consumer Price Index came out this morning, and it was soft. Uh, we saw some, uh, it was basically flat. I mean, it hadn't moved at all. So inflation is one of the variables clearly we watch. And particularly, we watch core inflation. That is stripping out volatile elements like food and energy that move around a lot. And look at some of the more fundamentals. And so if you look at the headline versus the core, there's a lot of fluctu fluctuation, particularly right now with energy prices. But those fluctuations are transient. And they don't really have an effect on the under underlying fundamentals of the economy. So what I'm watching right now is where that inflation is heading. Right? Uh, what direction it's heading, and again, how fast it's getting there. Right now, we're just not seeing significant upward pressure. It's not on an accelerated path. If anything, again, it, it's reported again today with CPI. It's actually softening and maybe uh, heading down a little bit. Now, if that scenario changes, I think we should act accordingly. But right now, we're not seeing a significant pressure. So given that situation, uh, the climate for inflation, continued strength in the labor market, very slight downward risks, solid but moderate growth projections for the next couple of years. And of course, we are in a climate of somewhat uncertainty in a variety of uh, measures. I continue to be in a wait and see mode. Now, we've used this word recently in our uh, Federal Open Market Committee statement, in our last statement, the word patience. Patience is a virtue. Uh, in this situation, there's no need uh, to move quickly because we can see how things unfold over time. This is a good situation we're in. So my own view is that we, I am forecasting one more 25 basis point rate increase for this year and another for 2020 to get to what we call the neutral rate, pretty much where we would be where the economy is just chugging along and it's 2% long-term growth path, not accelerating or decelerating from there. So that's my current stance. But of course, things can change, right? And so we have to be very vigilant about looking at the data as they come in. And I know there are a lot of people that wish we would stop penciling in our forecast with a pencil and put it in ink. I'm happy to do that, but it has to be invisible ink, right? I mean, we're not, because things do change, particularly in the situation we're in right now. Um, where there's all, the, all this uncertainty, 
We just have to see how things unfold. So that's my forecast for today, the date, remember, the day before Valentine's Day. Uh, so <laughs> shop early. Um, so that's my forecast for today, but we'll see how things unfold. So if I had a perfectly predictable uh, crystal ball, and uh, that prediction would be infallible, and I probably wouldn't be here because I have, would have already won the Powerball lottery, but that's not happening. So I think we just have to know that we, don't, we can't foresee the future that well, and we just have to act accordingly. So we can't, we can't predict with that absolute certainty, but we can make some educated guesses about a host of issues. The one, as I said in, my, in the beginning, that is of particular interest to us here in Philadelphia is the future of work and how cities and regions across the country are preparing for these changes that are happening in the workforce. They're already underway. Now, there have been two discussions, two different discussions about the labor market that have taken center stage as of late. The first being the skills shortage, and I mentioned, and the difficulties employers are uh, reporting and finding the workers they need with the right skills. But there's another one, and that's the effect of artificial intelligence and automation on the current and future employment landscape. Those two, though, obviously go hand in hand, and those two things are linked. While both have received an abundance of attention, the, discuss the discussions are decidedly nuanced, and it's important to understand both the risks and the opportunities that these issues present. Now, the opportunity is that we can see change coming, and we can ha prepare for it. We have time to prepare for it. But we have to rise to meet that challenge, too. It's not, it could either happen to us or we can create our future. I'm much more in the camp of creating our own future. And so this is in the economic interest of both individual businesses and cities and regions and, of course, individuals themselves to help pre prepare for that future. The risk, of course, is that we don't do that, right? We sit and we wait, and this then can overwhelm us. We need to prepare for this. Automation is coming. It has been coming through the dawn of humanity, right? I mean, the difference right now, I would say, is the pace, right? We've always had technology throughout the course of our human existence. But in this case, it seems to be coming at us faster and faster. So we need to, it's here. It's always been here. So I don't think we have to fear it. We have to figure out what to do with it. So much of the popular conversation, though, unfortunately veers from practicalities. Rather than looking at the jobs objectively that have already been or are on the precipice of automation, Speculation runs to the entirety of human capabilities somehow being mechanized, right? Skynet becoming active, the uh, Transformers taking over the world. I mean, maybe someday, but let's, let's be a little more practical. But the current trends in automation, what's, that, what's that, that's done, I think, is thrown into stark relief the importance of our uniquely human attributes, what we tend to call soft skills. These are as in demand by employers as technical skills, and in some cases, more so. The truth is that the scope of artificial intelligence is limited to our input. It's sort of garbage in, garbage out, data in, data out. That is, machines are only as smart as we make them. The important conversation, in my view, is not whether robots may someday write the great American novel or something like that, but what the current capabilities of automation mean for the people in our workforce right now and how it will shape our near future. So we recently published research on the likely effects of automation, both within the Federal Reserve's third district, where you sit right now, which by the way is, our district is Johnstown, Pennsylvania, east in Pennsylvania, uh, Mercer County, south in New Jersey, and all of Delaware. We're a small geographic district, but with lots of diversity in that district. So we published this not only in communities in the district, in the effect of automation on the communities in our district, but also in the country as a whole. We not only identified those jobs that are in danger of automating, we actually assigned degrees of likelihood to their eventual demise. And we also looked at who's doing those jobs that are at risk. Who would be the hardest hit? And whether and where the new jobs might be created to fill in for the jobs that are going to be lost. Now we concluded that Almost one in five jobs, one in five jobs in our district have a 95% ch 
chance or better of being automated. And that the people doing those jobs are some of the economy and our community's most vulnerable workers. Well, some people won't be, they will get absorbed into new jobs. They will get upskilled or reskilled or differently skilled. Some won't. I mean, I think we have to recognize that. So instead of leaving the disruption of various industries to fate as this un unfolds, we actually have an opportunity to think about how to train workers whose jobs will likely disappear to do the jobs that are more secure and from the ones that have yet to be created to the ones that are standing empty right now. We have a chance, again, to create our future. And as I mentioned, one of the most frequent complaints we've heard from business is the shortage of skilled workers. Now, while there has been some debate about the skill shortage, our research certainly points to a gap. And the JOLTS data, this job openings and quits data, ab absolutely support this. So we have some other research underway as well. Our economists took a very, very large data set. More than 90% of all online job postings. This is a big data set. And they, what they wanted to do is analyze what factors impact the length of time a job stays open, or in their parlance, the time to fill. So how long it takes to fill that job. They looked over a two-year span, from 2015 to 2017, for the 50 largest metropolitan statistical areas to see, among other things, what factors influence the time to fill, that stretch, and whether requirements for certain levels of experience and educational attainment affect that metric. Their preliminary findings confirm what we've been hearing anecdotally and what we've seen in other research, that there is a real gap between the skills employers want and need and those that are available in today's labor force. They found, for example, the easiest jobs to fill are those that are generally routine, manual positions. By the way, the same ones that are at the highest risk of being automated. The most difficult to fill are those that require specific cognitive and uniquely human skills. Teachers, for instance, or psychiatrists and psychologists. The more the skill is required, the longer a job takes to fill. Likewise, the higher the bar for educational attainment and years of experience, the more that the time that the position will stay open longer. While the research is not yet published, the early findings pose questions for the labor market. Should, for instance, employers consider hiring candidates who are good, maybe not perfect, maybe not ideal, but good, and focus on in-house training to make up the difference? Consider, considering the com combined losses associated with all those unfilled positions, and there are many in the economy, and the expense of candidate searches, constantly looking for people, it's likely to be much more cost-effective for organizations to increase the amount of in-house training that they're doing. Now, this is something we've actually been discussing with employers across the region. In fact, the Philadelphia Fed has formed a quite unique partnership with Philadelphia Works. Some of you may know them. They're the local government-supported job training program. Uh, Social Finance, which is a nonprofit that helps people think creatively about how to use different types of financing to solve societal problems, and a local tech company to change the way we prepare the local workforce for the future of work. This pilot is really unique. It's a unique public-private partnership in which the public sector, Philadelphia Works, will provide customized training, and particularly around digital skills, and the employer will repay the cost of that training once outcomes are realized. Now, put this in perspective. Within, we've been doing a lot of work in the in the Philly Fed, but across the Federal Reserve System on workforce development. We had a major conference about a year and a half ago on this in Austin. We just put out a book. I would encourage you to read the whole book, but it's 1,500 pages long in three volumes. Um, it's, it's really, I, even I haven't read the whole book yet, and so it just came out. But this is an area of real uh, emphasis for the Fed. And this public-private partnership is quite unique because the typical model is what people call the train and pray model. We think this is what the, public, uh, the private sector wants. We'll train people for that, and then we'll just pray they get a job. This is different. This is a very close relationship between Philadelphia Works and this company to create the workforce that they need. So it is absolutely the case, the reality, that this tight labor market means employers have to start thinking creatively, differently, and longer term about how they're going to address this gap between the skills they want and need 
and those available in the labor pool. And again, what makes this project stand out is just that. Unlike many of these programs, this employer is not funding this through their philanthropic arm, their foundation. This is coming right out of their HR budget. They see this as a business decision. This is not just a social good. This is a hard-nosed hard business decision. And what they're, what they're going to get out of this, they're going to get an agile workforce, a trained workforce, but the city will get an even better educated, better trained population. It's a win-win. So it's my hope that more businesses in this region, and we hope this will be a model for the country, will begin to take another look, a creative look at how they're approaching training and hiring. This will be especially important, and it is becoming incredibly important as we, the baby boom generation, continue our in inevitable march uh, toward retirement. And the, this importance then of a succession planning in these companies and is really rising in urgency all across the professional spectrum. I mean, you can see it. You can see it in every company we visit. You can ask the leadership of those companies, what's your biggest challenge? It's, I gotta replace these boomers and I don't have the next generation coming behind them. So let me just wrap up. Uh, the economy continues, it continues to do well. So I am happily patient to continue to see this unfold and be patient about raising rates as we move forward. And again, adjust accordingly as the data may change. And more importantly, and just equally important I should say, I hope at this point in our labor market's history, this proves to be a catalyst for employers to reconsider, and government entities to reconsider their approach to training and what role they all can play in partnership to arm people with the skills they need, their employees need, and frankly, all our communities need. Let me stop there and see what's on your mind. Well, that's all automation, AI, it's all wrapped in, it's all wrapped together. Yes? Yeah. We have the media listening in, so. Yeah, very interesting, but I, I've always wondered what is the um, connection between the Federal Reserve Board that we hear about a lot and the Federal Reserve Bank? Yes, so I'll give you a quick primer of the Federal Reserve System, particularly this is important in the city of brotherly love where we stand. You go over on 3rd and Chestnut, uh, we have the first and second banks in the United States. Hamilton's Bank, which is now owned by the National Park Service, and they're bringing that into service as a museum of American banking and American central banking. So we're working closely with them on this issue. In fact, Governor Wolf was just here a few months ago. The state has committed $8 million to bring that back, bank back into service. It's a beautiful little building. After the charter fails, because we, we've always had this tension between centralization and decentralization in American history, right? It's been part of our culture. So, and there's been this tension between the merchants and the bankers and the farmers, that's the way it was back in the beginning of our country, and neither trusted each other either. So that bank, the charter lapses, Congress doesn't renew it, uh, Stephen Gerard grabs the building and creates Gerard Bank. Around the corner, the second bank is now a, uh, a portrait gallery, the same thing happens, Char there's a couple banking crises, we need something called a central bank, we create it, uh, Andrew Jackson, a populist rails against this, a charter does not get renewed, and Biddle creates his bank, and that's the second bank. And then we go on and on and on. In 1907, there's a major banking crisis. J.P. Morgan comes in and saves the country. I mean, a major yeah. banking crisis. You gotta imagine in this period, uh, Rabbi held up a dollar bill, uh, you could take that anywhere in the country. That was not the case in the beginning of the history of banking, right? I mean. The Bank of Elmer, New Jersey would issue currency and you tried to bring it to Lansdowne, PA and say, this is good currency. And they said, no, it isn't. It's from some place I never heard of. So it, it, we, that, there was not only chaos in terms of being able to transact across the economy, but uh, we actually had a major bank failure in 1907. After the dust settled, everybody said, thanks, J.P. Morgan, um, but maybe we shouldn't let a private, how if we didn't have a J.P. Morgan? And so this goes on, there's an active debate. There's a great book called America's Bank by Lowenstein that lays out this history. And this culminates in 1914, the emergence of the Federal Reserve System, a unique public-private partnership in America, throughout the world. 
we are a system, we are a decentralized central bank. Now that sounds like an oxymoron, it is, but that's, we've always lived with this tension in American culture. So the Board of Governors in Washington, they are seven in number. We don't quite have seven right now. There are two openings. They are presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed. They set the policies, save one, regulatory policies and other policies for the system. We, the 12 independent reserve banks, we are public-private partners. We are separate corporations. None of the employees here are government employees. We're employees of this bank. Um, we. And we, I have a board of directors, I have shareholders, I operate as a, a corporate entity. And so we are the bank uh, of the system. And we are a bank. This is a part, we, everybody thinks of monetary policy. The Federal Open Market Committee, the meetings consist of the governors and all the presidents. The voting members consist of the governors, the president of the bank of New York, because they run the open market desk that trades to implement monetary policy, and four of us, the presidents. And we rotate those positions. The media talks a lot about who's a voting and non-voting member. The voting is literally the last 30 seconds of the meeting. You can't tell who's a voting and non-voting member until that point. Um, so we are, we constitute the system. We are a bank. We're a bank to banks. Below our feet are armored vehicles coming in and out from banks. Uh, we lend to banks through what's called the discount window. And we are the U.S. government's bank. We're the fiscal agent for the U.S. government. We're the Treasury's bank. Um, the interesting thing about this is that we, the 12 presidents, in coordination with the Board of Governors, run the operations of this system. Um, there's no boss of the system. We run it as a collective. It's a very complicated system. Uh, so that's the one thing that was a surprise to me when I got inside the tent here. I was a director at first. It's just how complicated the governance of the system is. But it works. It is a uniquely, quintessentially American institution. And it's worked for now over 100 years. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. Um, Pat, two questions. When you were talking in the beginning about um, all these jobs being unfilled, but I had read in the Wall Street Journal that there were like 100,000 trucker jobs that need to be filled, but the pay's not good enough for the people to even take the jobs. And the other um, statistic you're mentioning about people coming back in the workforce, are they coming back in because the workforce has all these jobs, or they can't afford to be retired? I need to continue to work into 70s because they just don't have enough money. Yeah, they're, 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 they're very good questions. So let me start with the latter, and then I'll uh, come to the first question. So the evidence is a little mixed on. The, so some people are staying in their jobs longer. That's definitely true. And so it's not necessarily people coming back in the workforce who have retired. There's some of that. But it's people just staying longer. Some of that is employers. We've heard stories of this who are paying bonuses, basically retention bonuses, because they can't lose that machinist, right? Uh, because they can't replace that machinist right now with that skill. And so that, uh, that continues to go on. Some of it is people, and we often thought, uh, and this was a prevailing view until some of our researchers here, uh, Shigeru Fujita, one of our economists, did this work. We often thought that when you, when you were disabled, you went into basically what you know, quants like me call it a absorbing state. That is, once you're in, you never come out. That's not true. What we're now realizing is that disability is cyclical as well with the economy, more so than we thought before. And in fact, we're starting to see some creative and really uh, innovative thinking around that particular issue. One of my good buddies from Delaware who had an uh, IT business sold his share in that IT business, and now has a, uh, a B Corp, so a social, you know, with a social mission, to bring adults with autism into the workforce, particularly in IT jobs. And so we're starting to think creatively and differently about what is a disability, because for some people, clearly, autism is viewed as a disability. But for certain jobs, like software verification and testing, it's actually, in some ways, a benefit. So it's changing the mindset of what we even call a disability today, which I think is very positive uh, for our society, right? To, to think of people differently than you're disabled and you can't contribute. It, that's not true. So that's all happening, and that's, that's actually bringing more and more people off the side, sideline. And so, but then there's the question of pay, and this is an interesting question. We are seeing wages go up, but not dramatically. 
But we are, but that, the averages hide a lot. So a lot, many of the jobs that we're creating are lower wage jobs, right? So they're in the service sector, or even in healthcare, there are a lot of lower wage jobs, right? Orderlies and so forth, relatively speaking. We think of healthcare as everybody being a doctor or nurse, but there's lots of other jobs, uh, food service and so forth, in these facilities. So we are seeing in some cases that there's creation of a lot of those lower wage jobs, as I said in my prepared remarks, because they're hard to automate, right? So you're gonna need those, for now, they're hard to automate, maybe not forever. There is clearly, what we're hearing, I'll get, give you a couple of anecdotes. So, there's a guy up in Lehigh Valley who has a truck repair business. He's paying his diesel mechanics over $100,000 a year. Can't find people. And I can go on and on about these anecdotes. Why? Uh, well, this is also an area that we're doing a lot of work on in Philadelphia. We've done, and we're going to release our third version of this, along with our colleagues in Cleveland and Atlanta, here in a few months. We've created this concept called opportunity occupation. Jobs that pay above median wages, that is good living wage, where you don't need a four-year college degree. We know what they are, we know where they are by geography, and we know the future of these jobs. Uh, there are a lot of those in the economy. I am convinced and we are convinced that not everybody needs to go to college or needs to go to college right away. And that's a very strange thing for a former university president to say, uh, but it's true. We need plumbers, we need electricians. I was just meeting with a major home, national home builder the other day. Their limit right now on building homes is not demand, it's supply. They can't find the people. They, they simply cannot find the people with these skills. And frankly, I think we've undervalued that kind of work in our society. And, and I think we need to change that. And so we've done a lot of work, for example, here, we've released a report a couple years ago on apprenticeship programs. Apprenticeship programs are not your grandmother and grandfather's <laughs> apprenticeship programs. They're well beyond construction and manufacturing now. You see them in healthcare, you see them in IT, you see them all across the board. So there's different ways of thinking about creating this workforce that we need to invest in. So yeah, I mean, in those cases, the wages are going up, they just literally cannot find the people with the right skill set. Because, you, you know, you have to be an electrician, you have to go through training, you know. So that, the, but, for, but the average is being held down by the growth of a lot of the lower wage jobs. What else? Yes. Um, going back to what you were saying earlier about the need for, um, for computer science skills to succeed, you know, in today's world. There happens to be today in the New York Times an article which strongly uh, reflects what you've been saying today. Um, and I just wanted to share it with, with people here and with you. Um, the College Board, which is the organization that produces the SAT and the advanced placement courses, their two leaders are now gearing the SAT and the um, advanced placement program towards computer science and the Constitution, because yeah, those are the two codes. You read it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to read one sentence from people here. Um, they were asked why they're gearing um, you know, their stuff to computer science, and this is what they say. With computing, the internet, big data, and artificial intelligence, now the essential building blocks of almost every industry, any young person who can master the principles and basic coding techniques that drive computers and other devices quote, will be more prepared for nearly every job. Yeah, and, I, and so that's true for college graduates, and I, I absolutely believe this. I, I think we are rightfully focused educationally on illiteracy, and, and, but we should also be focused on innumeracy. And I think that's part of a broader issue about it's not just coding, but it's, it is completely fine. My wife uh, is a middle school math teacher. And lots of kids will say, well, I'm just no good at math. And somehow that's okay. Well, I'm just not good at math. We don't say that about writing and reading. We don't say, well, I'm just no good at reading. <laughs> so I'm just not gonna do it. Uh, we, we should demand, right, in our educational system that innumeracy be eliminated just like illiteracy is. Uh, but the other point of that is, when I was talking about that diesel mechanic, that truck mechanic, they need as much digital skills. They're not coding the truck, but they need a facility with digital technology because that truck is more computer than it is anything else now. Same with a car, same with lots, of, same with working with numerically controlled machines 
in a manufacturing facility. You're not working the lathe anymore. You're programming those machines. And so everybody in the society, every job, is some mix of manual labor, cognitive labor, and digital skill all intermixed. And we just need to give, starting very early age, uh, people better tools and better education in this area. And demand that we give it, right? Again, I, I completely reject this idea that I'm just no good at math, so. Well, that means one of two things. Either we're not stressing the importance enough or we're not teaching it the right way. We should not accept as an answer, I'll just give up. Because that, that, that's not the, the future that child needs. What else? Yes, microphone, please. Hi, so for those that don't know me, I'm with the fellow of Israel Chamber. So we talk with companies, and I see some of our clients telling me that they anticipate uh, economic slowdown in the second or third quarter. Yep. They also are diverting manufacturing because of tariffs and immigration laws, um, and, and that's across the board in different industries. How do you see that impacting us in the near future? Thank you. So in a variety of ways. So first, in the global situation, um, when I said there's a lot of risk uh, and ambiguity, I would say ambiguity means you can't even tell the risk. You can't even assign the probability. There are a lot of risks out there. Brexit, China, Germany slowing down. I mean, there's lots of potential negative headwinds to the economy. For example, take Brexit. The, if you just sort of take a, a narrow lens on the effect uh, Brexit would have uh, on the U.S. economy, it's not that big because it, it's the UK economy, relatively speaking, the world is not that big. However, if there's contagion across Europe or across the globe, then we're in a different ballgame. So I think these are the risks that we're facing. Uh, tariffs, tariffs affect you know, manufacturing here in this country. While it's a very important sector of the country, we're still 70 plus percent service-based in this economy. However, again, if that has a contagion effect, um, that could be quite severe. Uh, and we're hearing the same thing uh, with people altering their supply chains uh, to try to work around the situation uh, that we're facing, right? So uh, I'm, in, I'm not a fan of, I'll be blunt, I'm not a fan of tariffs. I've given this speech before. Uh, I think the general economic profession would agree with that. I think fair trade is absolutely important, but tariffs are a tax ultimately on somebody, right? Where they fall, that's, that depends, but they, t they fall on somebody. So I think we, and then the last piece you raised was something we're hearing over and over and over again, and that's immigration. Let me be very clear. I am not in the business of telling other branches of government what to do, right? We've got enough on our hands. But I can just, but I can just state an economic fact, right? The fun, there aren't many fundamental laws of economics, but this is one. Long-term economic growth, not the fluctuation that happens quarter to quarter, year to year. Long-term economic growth is two variables, productivity growth and growth of the labor force. That's it. If, if you don't have growth of the labor force, and we're, right, you look at our demographics, we're not replacing ourselves as a society right now. Right? Our birth rate is not replacing ourselves. We're not as bad as some other countries like Japan and, and some of the European countries, but Without sensible immigration, you're starting to see this bite. Farmers are now complaining. There's an article in today's, I think, Wall Street Journal of Iowa farmers complaining they need people to work. Um, you just go down to southern Delaware uh, into the poultry processing facilities. They need people to work. And so all across the board, I mean, sensible immigration policy seems to be a reasonable thing to do. I'm not telling people what that is. That's not my job. But I think the economic fact is very clear, because we've not seen productivity growth pick up substantially. It's picked up a little bit. Not sub so the only other variable is the labor force. That's all you got. Yes, sir. Hey, I was wondering your thoughts on the addition to the national debt, <laughs> and if you think that uh, the recent tax cut and where it went to mainly will have long-term benefits or, or, or negative? So, uh, again, I have to be tread carefully here, but let me stick with the economics. Uh, 
So if we look at where we are, because the, the debt itself doesn't matter, right? It's debt relative to GDP, right? And it's what you're paying for that debt relative to the growth of the economy, right? So right now, we are hitting a pretty much a high, coming back toward the highs of the Second World War in terms of jet debt to GDP. That is a long-term risk to this economy, in my view. I know some people disagree with that. They're saying basically, look, as long as you get a return higher than what you're borrowing the money for, right? in other words, as long as interest rates remain low and you can get a reasonable return, you're good. But I'm skeptical about that argument for a variety of reasons. And first, look at where the debt is being created. I mean, it's, you, know, you all know Pareto's law, 80-20, you know, the 80-20 rule. You focus on the 80%, that's what you do in your businesses. So what's the 80% of the U.S. federal debt, the federal budget? Entitlements, interest on the debt, and defense. The rest is 20% or less. That's the only way to solve this problem is either bring more revenue in or deal with those issues. They're your only two choices, right? And we can put a lot of rhetoric around that, but they're just, that, that's it. That's, they're the only two choices you can make. So with respect to the, um, the tax cut that we just had, it did add to the debt. Uh, it did, um, as you can see, I mean, the numbers are self-evident. Uh, it did have an immediate impact on the economy, but that is waning. That's why we saw the GDP spike up, and now it's coming back to trend. That, that was not going to have a long-lasting effect. There has been recent data that uh, is quite uh, consistent with my own personal view that uh, a lot of that was used for things like stock buybacks and so forth, which, if that money then gets spent, can have a multiplier effect in the economy. So it's not like we just threw the money away. However, it didn't get used in a way that people thought on capital expenditure uh, for a variety of reasons. I think some of it is the uncertainty about things like tariffs and so forth. What we're hearing from a lot of business contacts is I'll just hold off a little bit and see how things unfold before I make that final decision to invest. That's a perfectly reasonable thing from their perspective. Also, if you're sitting on a corporate board, and I used to sit on several corporate boards, if you have your choice between increasing the dividend, stock buyback, or taking a long-term risky project in this environment, which one do you do? Again, perfectly reasonable decision from those corporate leaders to do that. I'm not criticizing that. But it was also perfectly predictable, in my view, that they were going to do that. Uh, because what I heard from our contacts is if you are a large firm with a good balance sheet, the money was incredibly cheap. I mean, not just banks, but private equity firms, lots of people were coming and offering you incredible deals. The la you know, access to capital was not the limiting factor in the pace in which these firms were making investments at that point. It just, there's no evidence that that was true. And so, uh, you know, we, what we got is what we, most economists would have predicted. Uh, with this tax cut, and that's what we're seeing play out. By the way, I don't know where all the deficit hawks went in Washington, but nobody seems to get, I care, because I think that we'll have a long-term negative impact on this economy. Yes, sir? Just going back to your farmer and label, labor uh, analogy, is it a true statement essentially that, that perhaps they're waiting for low-wage workers, but if the jobs are there and essentially there's other ways, to, other variables to treat for it, including paying more for those who are here um, and making immigration less of an... Well, that raises a, bro a broader issue. I gave this speech a while ago on dynamism of the U.S. economy. What you're saying presupposes something that is natural to presuppose, that if I'm sitting here in the city of Philadelphia without a job and there's a farm job that's paying well in, oh, in Iowa, I'll pack up and move. We are at a significant low in terms of movement within the United States. We, the dy there's dynamism in various forms, like new business formation and so forth, is actually waning. I and mean, this is a whole different speech for a different time. But part of that, too, is we don't move like we used to move. Why? There's a lot of culprits. So imagine the situation right now where I'm getting a relatively low-income job, but daycare is pretty expensive. I need to live near mom or dad. I can't move. Or mom or dad, we can't afford to put them in assisted living. Somebody needs to take care of mom or dad. 
Right? These are the pressures on the American society right now. And so while it may seem reasonable to pack up and move to that up job, a lot of people can't. In fact, there's a recent piece on NPR about one of the plant closings, the autom automotive plant closings, and they're moving the job to, I think, Tennessee, but don't quote me on that. And they're talking to different people. Some people are going. Some people say, I can't for all these reasons. I can't leave here. What are you going to do? There's no job. I don't know, but I can't leave right now. So I think those pressures are very real on the American society. And you see this even in a microcosm here in Philadelphia. Uh, we've launched something, by the way, called the Economic Growth and Mobility Project. It's part of our community development effort to try to help low-income communities make that shift to a better world. And there's three legs to our research and outreach and, and convening to help move the needle on these. One is creating jobs, sustainable jobs that give a living wage. Second are the skills, and that's what we're talking about with Philadelphia Works. The third is infrastructure. If you can't live near a job, or you can't get to the job, or you don't have broadband access so the job can come to you, you don't have a job. This is the debate that's going on right now in this city with respect to the rail line out to King of Prussia. You talk to the leadership of the people out there in King of Prussia, they need workers. But it is perfectly reasonable economic decision for people sitting here in this city to say, look, I gotta take three buses to get out there, and I have to drop my kid off at daycare and pick them up on time, and get paid minimum wage, it isn't worth it. I mean, so we often think about people as being, I reject completely this idea that they're lazy. No, they're making reasonable, rational choices given the situation they have in their life right there. What we need to do is figure out how to change the choice set so that it's easier for them to get to that job. Or they can, with affordable housing, live near that job. Because you see this in stark contrast in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. There are jobs that they can't fill because there's nobody even within miles that can afford to live anywhere close at, at the salaries that are being, and, and there is a limit to how much you're gonna pay somebody to do some of these jobs, right? So that's again where automation may kick in, that's part, but I think there, we just see, we don't see the movement we used to see in the American society, so we shouldn't bet on that going forward. We'll see some, but we shouldn't bet that that's gonna be the salvation, it's just not. Uh, maybe one more question, Mark? Or? Uh, the question I have, no doubt we're going to be asking Mayor Kenny next month, but with uh, regard to Amazon choosing not to come here and uh, whether we lack the technical talent yep. or we don't retain them once they graduate from here because we have some schools, could you comment on this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think. There are a variety of factors, obviously, and we don't know what Amazon was thinking completely. We don't know what they're gonna do now. I mean, they're trying to, they're, they're rethinking in some ways. But there is no question, because I've heard this not just with the Amazon situation. I heard this when I was down in Delaware, when we were trying to attract firms. What is the pipeline of the talent I need, the engineering talent, the computer science talent, uh, the bioengineering talent I need? Um, it is a problem in this region. Uh, and if you look at the schools that we have here, they're great institutions of higher education. But we don't produce the volume of those graduates like many other places. You know, and, uh, and that is a challenge for us. Uh, I, I think we're overcoming the not staying here thing. I, I think we are actually starting to move the needle on that in Philadelphia. This is a very attractive city for millennials. And so I, I don't think that is as much as a problem as it used to be. When I was at Wharton, 80 plus percent of the class went to Wall Street, right? It just, they just left here and, and went to Wall Street. You're seeing less of that. First, less are going into banking, more going into tech and so forth. But, um, and some of them, are more are sticking here, but still the, the majority, um, they do look elsewhere as well. And I think we need to increase, and it's expensive stuff to do, but STEM education, particularly at the higher education level, is very expensive stuff. And we've got uh, very good and large um, STEM disciplines in certain private institutions, but we also need affordable options for people to get that education as well. Not everybody can afford the tuitions at our private institutions. So that's why, and give you a sense of what this means, when I was at UD, at Delaware, we hadn't put up a new science building in over 20 years, science or engineering building, 20 years. 
that's multiple lifetimes in science. I mean, if you don't keep up, you're, if you don't keep up, you're done. You can't win the grants, you can't get the state-of-the-art equipment to train the young people on. And so that investment we put up in a very expensive 200 square, thousand square foot building that cost a ton of money, but it was necessary to compete. Um, we need to multiply that across the Philadelphia region. We're very good at many things, but I would say right now we don't have the volume of STEM graduates that we need, and we heard that from Amazon. So with that, again, thank you so much for being here.